announcements is blessed. Again, all glory be to the Most High God. Amen. And before the song plays, I'll just give you a short little explanation um, on what the song is about and why I made it. Uh, so, this song is called Free Man. Um, really, it just resembles the shift that, that I've been granted um, as I stepped into the truth of God. It tells me uh, the truth. Uh, God's word says that truth may set you free. Um, and that's what it's done to my life. I've been held bondage by demons and strongholds. Um, and over the course of just a year, I've seen substantial, significant um, changes in my strength. And I've been able to withstand, be free, and set apart from the strongholds of the flesh um, in my mind and just set apart from the ways of this world. And again, I can only give all the glory to God for that. And so in this song, I'm praising God and thanking him. Um, and then again, just also um, telling him that I know where my place is as a, as a human being, as a believer. Um, just asking him to continue to bless me with another day, another opportunity to live for him to be a better version of myself um, and to profess his name. And uh, yeah, now I'll, I'll let us all enjoy the song. How many of you guys wear glasses? Okay. Today I'm going to get you, get you fitted for some new lenses, all right? Every year or so, right, you kind of have to get your lenses adjusted. You go to the eye doctor, and uh, for years, many years, I was able to get by with cheaters, right? Just one lens, because my arms got too short as I got older. I, needed to have things farther and farther away. So the, the first thing that went in my vision was my ability to read up close. Now, some of you have a different thing where you need correction more for distance, so I know people who only wear glasses when they drive. 
So there's, there's actually like, like three levels, right? So there's this close-up reading level with the book. Then there's the computer distance, somewhere between three and five feet, I think it is. And then there's distance. And in each one of those areas, it's really important to be able to see clearly, isn't it? I mean, vision is such an amazing gift from God. So today I'm going to talk about three lenses through which to view controversial issues. Three lenses in which to view controversial issues. So, in order to, uh, I'm going to remind us where we were to bring us to this point as we've been, this is called Humility Week, so we're not, we're not trying to hate on people, we're not trying to be bigoted or anything like that. We are trying to live in a world that doesn't always agree with God, right, and his standards. Even our own lives are like a mixed bag, aren't they? Um, I was just listening this morning to, uh, must have been like second, the book of Second Kings where Solomon was there. And Solomon was given this amazing gift. He asked God for wisdom. It's like, what an amazing thing. God said, I'm going to give you, I'm going to make you wise. But he did the most foolish things that anybody could ever think of. And at the beginning of the chapter that I listened to this morning, it said that Solomon married the daughter of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, to make an alliance between them. That was a political kind of move that, that kings did back then. But it was like Solomon ended up with 700 wives and 300 concubines. It's like, that is not wise. And God said, all these women that you're going after draws your heart away from God. And so we have even our heroes in the Bible, right? Are, it's a mixed bag. It's a, it's a story of, yes, there's so many good qualities that we want to be like, like David. But there's so many bad qualities. We see them make terrible mistakes. And so we have that battle within us and we have that battle in our world when we try to follow Jesus. Like Malik's song said, is, I'm a new man, I'm a new person. God has come in, but I'm still fighting the battles to live for God. Okay? Diane, could I ask you to do a share screen for me? And then I can, then I can read it easier than on the back wall. Okay. So, last time we talked about Daniel and his friends and how they were able to live in that in two cultures. They were able to withstand the pressure from the Babylonian culture that was coming against them. They even changed their very names. They educated them to be Babylonian, to fit in with that culture, to be used there. But they were determined to not defile themselves. They were determined that we are going to follow God no matter what, even in this corrupt society. And a lot of times it didn't create friction. They could go along, they could love God, and they could serve their government, right? And it was, but there came points where those things came into conflict. And um, let's take a look at those quickly. Well, how did these guys do it? Just a few points from what we talked about before. It took training in the truth from childhood. These guys were like teenagers when they were uh, ripped out as, of their home situation as prisoners of war and taken to a faraway land. But somehow they maintained that truth and that dedication to God. Somehow they had that in their head. And we, I believe it was from their parents and from their community that kept training them to follow after God. And so they were able to maintain that. So just a thought. Any training that we do for children now is super important for what they're going to face in the future. They're going to have to make the decisions, but we want to make them ready to make them. Second point, that trust that God is good. So many of us, and even and I have struggled with this too, we believe that God's will is just going to be something miserable. It's just going to be hard. Well, sometimes the will of God is hard, but we have to believe as we read the book, we have to believe that God is good. That he's not out to just lurking around every corner to whack us on the head when we're out of line or to spoil our fun. No, God has our very best in mind for us. And along with that is the conviction that God knows best. 
Even when our culture says, and we've been indoctrinated, we've been persuaded from childhood on certain things by whatever culture that we come from, that certain things are right and certain things are wrong. And that's why we check it out with the Bible. Well, what did God say about that? It's legal to, in Minnesota right now, it's, it's legal to kill a child in the womb up to the point of birth. Okay? So that's a legal thing that Minnesota has said, that's okay. We believe it's all right to do. But we have to go back to the books, right? And say, does God really say that? And then we come in and, and bring that, then we come into conflict in a sense with what does God say and what does the human government say? Or what does our boss say? If our boss at work wants us to lie on a report and we know that God doesn't want us to do that, we come in conflict. And how do we handle those things? We have to have that conviction. God does know best. God is way smarter than I am. We also have to have the courage to say no. Daniel and his three friends, they said no at the cost of their lives. I mean, they could have lost their lives. God miraculously intervened in the fire with the three guys and in the lion's den with Daniel to rescue them. But there was no guarantees. They had to be willing to say no and lay their life down. They also had to have wisdom to know when and how to live or speak God's truth when it disagrees with the culture. Daniel asked permission to have a different diet when they first entered that training. He had wisdom and he was, God gave him favor with the guy that was in charge so that they could experiment with a, a different diet for them so that he wouldn't defile himself. And then the last point there is, is the willingness to face the consequences of others' disapproval. Daniel, or Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah was their Hebrew names. They told the king, you know, you can kill us, God can save us, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to obey you. We are not going to bow down to your statue. And they were willing to face that consequence. Okay. So here's the, a little bit of clarity from the New Testament about culture. How do we live in a culture? Okay, to be a Christian does not mean to be American. To be American from the United States does not mean that you are Christian. To be from another country does not mean that you are whatever they are. You have a decision to make, and there is always going to be a conflict between being a follower of Jesus Christ and the culture. Here are some examples. Luke 9, 44. Jesus said this, You unbelieving and perverse generation, how long shall I stay with you and put up with you? Acts 2.40, Peter is preaching. He says, with many other words, Peter warned them, and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Okay, I think of Malik's song, his music was like that, right? God saves us out of a corrupt generation. We cannot just go on our own business thinking that everything, everything that our culture says is all right, that our music, our media, our social media, our government, our laws... We can't go along thinking that everything that they're going to do is right. Because it's, it's a human government and there's bound to be flaws and sins with it. Philippians 2.15 So that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. So Paul is writing to the church. He says, Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. He's saying you are meant to be a contrast to this culture, to your school culture, to your family culture, to your job culture, to your neighborhood culture. Okay, we are meant to shine and be different. So the fact is, it's just assumed the standards that people have around us are going to be different than ours. Here's a passage that basically says, kind of wraps it all up. Peter says this in, in chapter 2. Of uh, First Peter, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles. Okay, he says this is what it's like to live here. It's like being a foreigner and an exile. It's like you don't belong here. You're, this is your place where you live. Okay, you're feeling at home here. You need to live and work and raise your family here. But you know what? You really belong to another culture that's different. And so he says, I urge you, as foreigners and exiles, to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. 
Abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Things around you are battling you. They are trying to drag you away and me away. So there's a war going on and we need to face that battle. Ephesians 6 tells us how to do that. So Peter also says, how do we do that? Well, we, number one, we live such good lives among the pagans that though they, that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So Peter's saying, how do, how do we make a difference in our culture? Number one is you live good. You live well. You live according to God's way of doing things. And because you love God, you are going to love people. We can't do that other, we can't do one without the other. We have to, when we love God, we have to love people. Sometimes there's a break in our maturity when we think that we can be cranky and mean and judgmental and whatever and still love God. You ever seen hateful, bitter, angry Christians? It's like an oxymoron. It's like the Bible says you can't love God and hate people. Okay, we all struggle with that. So what Peter's saying is, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. That's exactly what happened to Daniel. They backed him into a corner. The only thing they could find against him was that he prayed three times a day. And they caught him in that. They fabricated a law to make it illegal to pray to God. And they nailed him. And they threw him into the lion's den and God protected him. Verse 13, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority. So here's that other side. Okay, we're not to just be casual and callous lawbreakers because, oh, I live in a different world. I live under different rules. No, submit yourselves for God's sake, for the Lord's sake, to every human authority, whether to the emperor, who was not a good guy, the emperor as the supreme authority, or to the governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. There's the purpose of human government, if you ever wonder. To punish those who do wrong, to commend those who do right. Verse 15, for it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. People are going to talk about you. They're going to talk against you if you live for Jesus at your job, in your school. If you're up front about it, if we're not hiding, like a, I'm a secret Christian kind of thing. Now, if you're up front and people know that, then expect that people are going to say things about you. But how do you silence that? It is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. And then he says, live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. And so he's saying, live in that tension. Here's some pointers, but it's that tension. How do you honor the government that's over you if they're telling you to do wrong things? And we have examples of that, the New Testament example of they told the, the disciples after Jesus was, went back to heaven, the book of Acts, they said, do not speak anymore in the name of Jesus. Stop healing people in the name of Jesus. And they said, you judge whether it's right for us to obey God or to obey you. So when, there was, when human government comes in conflict, conflict with God's rules, we must obey God. But then it takes wisdom to know, how do we do that? Okay? So now we're going to get to lens number one. Okay? Remember we talked about three levels. We got the reading level, we got the computer level, and we got the distance level. Okay? We need all three of those, and I have... These are so cool. These are my new glasses. My first pair of glasses, but there's three lenses built into it, okay? So I can read up close, I can see the computer when I look in the middle, and I can see you guys. You know what, when I wore these before, I could see up here, but I, can't, I couldn't see your face. So if you were asleep, it was like, I don't know, Pastor Larry doesn't know. But now I can see, because I got these. It's so important to have all three of those, and so listen carefully as I talk about these three lenses. The first lens that I'm gonna talk about today is the big picture lens of truth versus lies. The big picture lens of truth versus lies, and by this I mean making a case for, or arguing for, persuading for, thinking for an important 
biblical issue, biblical idea. So making a case for important biblical ideas of right and wrong, and sometimes calling it out. Again, this takes wisdom. Okay, this is not just an easy, just do this, do this. We have to be walking closely with God so that we have the big picture lens at first. So we're talking about issues here. We're not talking about a person that struggles with a particular issue. We're talking about what are big issues of right and wrong that we understand, especially at a cultural level. <clears throat> and we have a lot of those. So we, we have social justice, right? What do Christians think about social justice? What do we do? How do we respond to you know, things like George Floyd? Black Lives Matter. You know, there's, there's big issues out there, and we need to be able to address those as Christians. We don't have to be silent about them. We can speak out about them. We can make a case for them. But again, remember what Peter said. You know, don't be a jerk about it. You know, if people reject you, at least don't let it be about your character and that you are a mean person in disagreeing, okay? That you're a hater. No, they say, yeah, I don't ad agree with Pastor Larry, but at least he's a nice guy, right, about it. So this is the big picture, the first lens that we look at in Daniel 4.27. This is the chapter we didn't talk about last week. But Daniel had an opportunity to speak to his big boss, the guy who is the most powerful man in the world. Daniel was working for them, and he, Nebuchadnezzar had this dream. Daniel was called in to interpret the dream, and at the end of it, he says this, Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right, and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be then, it may be that then your prosperity will continue, because God said he's going to be seven years out of his mind, because he wouldn't acknowledge God. And it happened. Nebuchadnezzar finally came to his senses. It took seven years where he lived like an animal. His hair grew like feathers. His fingernails were like claws. And he came to his senses and acknowledged the Most High God at the end of that. Daniel gave him an opportunity to say, dude, you don't have to spend seven years eating grass. You can do it right now. What you can do, you need to renounce your sins. You need to do what is right. You need to renounce the wickedness that you've been doing. You are a wicked man, okay? That takes guts to speak to the most powerful man in the world and say, you are a sinner and you need to repent before God. Being kind to the oppressed. He's talking about justice. So Daniel was, had the courage and the wisdom to do that. Lens number one is he was able to even bring it out in the open. There is a disagreement between you, king, and what God says, and you had better line up with God. I'm just warning you. In Mark chapter 6, we have John the Baptist. Listen to this. This is about John the Baptist, who was a very outspoken guy. He said this, this is, and he was speaking against Herod. Herod was like the, the installed Jewish king of the land. He said this, For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested, and he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So if somebody has the power, if somebody has the power to execute you and throw you in prison, will you have the courage to say what you're doing is wrong, sir? John spoke about it. He got thrown in prison and is actually, he was actually beheaded. So John is an example of dealing with big issues and being upfront about it. He's confronting a political leader and saying, what you are doing is wrong. And then in Matthew 18, Jesus is warning. He says, if any, of, any one of you causes these little ones, those who believe in me, to stumble, it would be better for them to have a large millstone hung around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. Verse 7, woe to the world because of the things that cause people to stumble. Such things must come, but woe to the person through whom they come. Jesus is saying, dude, if you lead a little child astray, man, it would be better for you to be just drowned right now. Do not mess with my little ones, okay? Jesus' Jesus' warning is important because some of the things that our little ones are being taught, okay, in school is really wrong, and it's going to cause them to stumble 
And it's like, dude, you are going to be accountable to God as a teacher for the things that you do and don't say. Jesus said, woe to you. And I copied it down. And he said this to the, he said it to the, to the religious leaders of that time. He said it to cities who had listened to his preaching. He says, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. Woe to you, Pharisees, because you give God a tenth, but you neglect justice and the love of God. So Jesus, Jesus was tough on people sometimes. He spoke the truth. He did it in love, but it was true. May God give us that wisdom to have that same kind of clarity about the big issues, okay? The second part of this, the second lens, okay, that middle computer range lens is the picture, it's the big picture again, but it's of repentance. And this is owning our part of a sinful culture. So this is not always going out and pointing everybody's sin, but listen to this in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6. The prophet Isaiah has an experience of viewing God in the temple. And he's so overwhelmed by that that he says this in verse 5 of Isaiah 6. Then I said, it's all over. I am doomed, for I am a sinful man. Okay, so he's realizing his own sinfulness, right? But not only that, listen to this. I have filthy lips, and I live among a people with filthy lips. Yet I have seen the King, the Lord of Heaven's armies. And that's, you know, could preach a bunch, bunch of sermons on that. Nevertheless, Isaiah, a prophet, he said, I'm, I'm a sinner, but the people around me are sinful too. And he was confessing not just his own sins, but the sins of other people. Could we do that? Your workplace, okay? Your school, recognizing, this, God, this is a sinful place, okay? I might not be doing it, but I'm living among a people who do that. God, would you forgive us? I confess that sin before you, okay? In Daniel chapter 9 is an, an another amazing verse, and I wish we had time to, to dig into that more. But this whole passage, Daniel is saying, he's owning up to, he's basically confessing the sins of God's people. Daniel was a good guy. Daniel, they couldn't find, they couldn't dig any dirt up on Daniel. But what is he doing when he prays before God? He's fasting, he's in sackcloth and ashes, he's on his knees pleading for God's mercy, but saying he's confessing the sins of his people. The reason that they were deported like this, the reason that they were there is because God was punishing them. And that he deported them, that he promised that he would do that if they continued in their idol worshiping ways of rejecting him. Year after year, decade after decade, century after century, and finally God says, enough. I said what was going to happen is going to happen. And Daniel was owning that. God, we have done this. We have sinned. We have, we have fallen short. We have not obeyed you. We've created idols. Again, Daniel was a righteous guy, but he was confessing the sins of others. When you and I look at the sins of our culture, the things that bother us, I want us to have that big lens, okay? Second important lens. First important lens is to be able to discern the issues that are right and wrong, be able to debate them and even call them out. The second lens is to be able to own that as sinfulness and say, God, this is wrong. I confess this. I didn't do it, maybe, but it, it's all around me, and I bring it to you. So when, you, when you're rubbed the wrong way by Pride Month, you know, or by stuff that's just thrown in your face, Remember that we, part of this is we're going to own it. God, I'm a part of this culture, and this culture has authorized the killing of babies in a mother's womb, you know? And our culture has glorified something that you call wrong, sexual sin. And we, we've said it's okay. God, it's not. Would you forgive us for that? We repent of that. So there's that owning of it. Does that make sense? I'm encouraging, giving us some options of how can we deal with this rather than just being angry. We say, God, we confess it. I own it as well. In Luke 19, Jesus himself, it says, 
As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. He said, if you, even you, had known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. The days will come when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Here Jesus himself is weeping over the sins that are prevalent in that city that represented the whole kingdom of God. At his time, it was, he just saw what was coming and it brought tears to his eyes. How often do you and I weep over the sins around us? May God give us a heart to be able to see through that lens of these issues, okay? Okay, so then lens number three, the compassion lens. And this is the lens, so basically going from the big issues, okay, to how we deal with them in our heart with a heart of repentance and humility. And the up close ones is the compassion lens, seeking to bring healing to broken hearts. Okay, every one of the issues in our culture, okay, whether that's social injustice or whatever, has people who have a story behind it. So even if you disagree with whatever sin got them there, okay, you and I have a mission to accomplish with them that's beyond just arguing an issue. And this is where we need all three lenses to deal holistically with these issues. Matthew 9, 36. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. It didn't say Jesus just saw all these terrible sinners and got mad at them. He said he had compassion on them. Why? Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. They were, had been harassed and helpless. The people around you that have given in to sin, okay, they have a story that they have probably been harassed and helpless. They maybe they have been abused. Maybe the, the reason that they're in that lifestyle of sin right now is because somebody did something horrible to them that changed the course of their lives. In John 8, Jesus talked to a woman who was actually caught in the act of adultery, okay? And his words to her was, go and leave your sin. So, Neither do I condemn you. He confronted all the guys who were ready to throw rocks at her to kill her. And at the end, he says, where are they? He says, they're not here. He says, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Leave your life of sin. He dealt with her on a heart level of compassion, but he also told her, leave this lifestyle of yours. Okay? The woman at the well, similar thing. She says, you know, she says, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, yeah, you're right, because you've had five husbands, and the guy you're living with now, you're not even married to him. Okay, so Jesus was upfront about those issues, but what compassion he had on her, and that changed her life. Okay, it wasn't a condemning, it was a, it was a truth-filled encounter. Read that in John chapter 4, it's amazing. Mark chapter 9, the man with the demon-possessed son, one of my favorite phrases in the Bible. The disciples couldn't kill, get this demon out of the son, and Jesus says, you know, okay, I'll do it believe. And he says, well, the guy, the father says, I believe, but help my unbelief. Okay? But, so he was Jesus, again, dealing with truth in compassion. Zacchaeus, the tax collector, he was a no good guy, nobody liked him, but Jesus went to his house and it changed his life forever. It changed this, this guy who was a corrupt corrupt thief in a sense, at a government level. His life was changed because Jesus went to his house. And Jesus got in trouble for that because he went to be and hung out with sinners. And then the rich young ruler, another story in Mark chapter 10, where Jesus is saying, you know, what he asks, the, the guy asks him, what do I need to do to be, to be saved, right? So he said, well, follow the commands. Well, the guy says, well, I've done them all ever since I was a kid. Jesus looked at him and loved him and said, okay, sell everything you have, give to the poor, and then come follow me. You'll have treasures in heaven. And the guy was stunned and he said he went away sad because he was very rich. Jesus went on to say it's really hard for rich people to enter the kingdom of God. And he says Jesus loved this guy. He loved him. So at the same time as he was able to speak truth to him, he loved him. 
And Jesus was sad when he walked away from that opportunity. Okay, so that's just a, a few of those building blocks of what, what's involved in the three lenses that we deal with in cultural issues that are awkward, that are confronting us, that God is clear about. So lens number one, okay, the big picture lens of truth versus lies. You can talk about these issues, all right? It's different than if you're dealing with somebody who, since they were five years old, thought that they were born in the wrong body, right? When you're dealing with a person that since age five thought that they should have been a girl instead of a boy, you're dealing with somebody who has been really traumatized and has a lot of history there, okay? So to that person, you're not gonna debate necessarily, bring up all these issues. You wanna care for them first, right? Tell me your story. Tell me a little bit how you came to these conclusions and why you want to do this. Okay, because you're caring for them like Jesus would care for them. There does come a time where you need to speak and bring up those issues because you do care. Caring for people doesn't mean you ignore the issues that are plaguing them, right? A doctor, just to be a nice guy, doesn't say, well, you know, you're doing, you're doing better when the fact is you're dying of cancer. A doctor says compassionately, things are not looking good, we need to do something. Here's some treatment plans, some options for us. Okay, so we have the difference of the lenses. That personal compassion level is number three. Seeking to heal broken hearts. Seeing that every really out there sinner that's in your face really has a, an issue going on with them that needs healing, that only Jesus can deal with, right? We also need to own that sin, okay? That I'm not just pointing fingers at other people. I'm owning that. God, I'm living in this culture. We have made these laws. We voted these people in that make these laws or that, that celebrate these things. Lord, this must grieve your heart. Forgive, okay? An attitude of hum humble repentance, owning our part in the culture. And then the lens number one is we can talk about these issues, all right? If you have a politician, you have a senator, a representative, I have an ongoing email debates with my Minnesota se senator and representative and my national representative and senator where things that are wrong, I'm just going to say, please, will you consider that what you're voting for this year, this month, this week is, is really wrong, okay? And here's some logical reasons why, okay? I'm, that person is not necessarily dealing with that. I'm not dealing with a you know, a, a broken person, maybe, I probably am, but I want to be respectful and speak out and say, hey, you have authority and I am like Daniel, trying to be like Daniel. I'm asking you to think differently about this issue because it's clear. You want to be compassionate to people, but at the same time, you are voting to be brutal to others, okay? We can have those debates and dialogues Truth versus lies, so we make an important, make a case for important biblical ideas of right and wrong and sometimes calling it out. Okay? If any of these issues kind of rub you the wrong way, write down your questions, because in a sermon we can't always just deal with that, but if you have some questions, we'd love to like talk about that and see how does the Bible apply to like specific challenges that you face. All right? Thank you for listening. Let's, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you. You have placed us in such a unique time. Lord, I mean, we think of what was it like to be a Christian when Adolf Hitler was coming to power? And what was the church doing? And, and how could the church somehow be twisted to support the, uh, you know, the persecuting of Jews, the killing of Jews, taking their property and all. Lord, how can we not be brainwashed to be a part of the evil empire? God, how can we live in your kingdom and live in this kingdom, in this world, in this country, in this culture? How can we live for you? God, would you help us to have those important lenses where we're clear about issues, where we own them and we repent of them. So we're humble in our approach, but we're super compassionate with those who struggle with those issues who have had lives of trauma that have led to the place where they're at. So that we're not just judging their sin, but we're caring for their heart 
and want to bring healing, the healing that you bring. So let, let us deal with people the way you did, Jesus. We need your help to do that. Somehow make it clear. Give us, give us a set of trifocals that can do all three of those things. Thank you for these people who are listening now. Bless them. Bless us. Help us. In Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's sing our last song. Thank you.